We know you guys have been waiting for this video for a long time, so here it finally is. There are many things in this world that seem right in the moment, but are wrong in the grander scheme of things. Indulgence is a vice that seems harmless, but once you see the kind of depravity it can induce in people, you really start to think twice about letting yourself go in a pleasurable moment. Once you lose yourself to it, there is no coming back to normalcy, and that sentence is slan personified. She is lust incarnate. Her mind works on a single track basis, and that track usually usually involves two bodily fluids that should be nowhere near each other. And to make things worse, or we guess better if you swing her way, she is the second god hand member to be fixated with guts, which makes us think there's no way the black swordsman gets out of this story as a human at his core. But who was this sinful demon mother in her previous life, and how did she become who she is today? We'll get into all of that and more in this video. This is Slan's Origins Explored. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. She's based on a species of evolved humans from one of sci-fi's seminal creations, Slan by A. E. Van Vaught. A lot of science fiction and fantasy stories use their expansive and wondrous settings to tell tales that are, at their core, human. Dune is a story about why you should never follow one man's word blindly. A Song of Ice and Fire gives you a front seat to the human casualties that the Game of Thrones extracts from the world, fantasy or otherwise. A. E. Van Vaught's Slan is a story about minority persecution in a world where evolved humans exist, and how things are never quite what they seem to be. The title of this novel is actually the name of the evolved human species that form the core of Van Vaught's story. Allegedly created by a man named Samuel Lan, this species of humans is different from their Homo sapiens brethren thanks to a key evolutionary trait. They possess the power of telepathy. Don't get us wrong, all Slans are physically far superior than an average human, with muscles like steel cords and agility that would put Usain Bolt to shame. They could even regenerate themselves when fatally injured by entering a healing trance, which comes in handy when a slan is struck by a life-threatening disease or something. But their greatest strength is their telepathic abilities. Even among slans, there are two types of telepaths, showing that even this evolved state of humans had diversity within it. One type of slans had all the physical and mental superiority of this evolved species, but they lacked psionic powers besides the ability to shield their own thoughts from their superior counterparts. The reason they were superior was because they possessed tendrils that allowed them to read the minds of humans and telepathically communicate with other slans. This effectively meant that no one besides the inferior slans could shield their thoughts from them, and it made them an easy target for adherence of freedom. Well, that and the fact that their tendrils were golden, which made them a sitting duck for any hunter with enough skill. The story focuses on the life of nine-year-old Jommy Cross, a telepathic slan who was killed on his way to his species capital because his party was ambushed and his mother was killed. Now, he's the last hope of his kind, because, turns out, the Slans were being hunted down by mankind, down to the last member of their species. Jami's journey sees him go up against dictator Keir Gray, but at the end of his path, he discovers an unsettling truth about his own race. Slan is a melodramatic mess, which often acts too grand for what it is, but it remains a classic regardless for how well it interprets the idea of minority persecution. It just goes to show you how someone can be persecuted for being different, but that doesn't mean that something shady isn't going on behind the scenes. Secret cabals that control the world sounds insane to us, but it's the reality that the inhabitants of Van Vaught's Earth have to live with. This all sounds very similar to a certain group of goat worshippers we find just outside St. Albion in Berserk, and you'll see what we mean by that in a few minutes. Slan, the novel, is a paradoxical journey through life for a young man who bears the destiny of his kind upon his back. Slan, the character, is a demonic succubus who derives pleasure from the paradox of emotions, and she makes that very evident in her her first appearance. So let's get down to it and talk about Slan Sama's debut. She is the most impressed and impressive member of the God Hand, Slan's introduction to Berserk. No group of demonic entities can ever truly be called complete if it doesn't come with at least one succubus, and that is also the case for the God Hand. Slan debuts alongside the rest of her kinsmen towards the end of Guardian Angels of Desire Part 4, and despite not being the centerpiece of this entire episode, she kind of is, if you know what we mean. After the Count's blood, despair, and deep desire to live flow into and activate his Behelet, 
it, the god hand descends upon his castle, as it is swallowed by an interstice. The black swordsman is enraged by the appearance of an angel he calls Griffin, and tries to lunge at him to no avail. The Count is only concerned with Guts's death, so he immediately calls out to Archangel Void to grant him his wish and avenge him by killing the black swordsman, but Void flatly refuses. When the Count asks why, Slan explains the way his desire works in conjunction with the Behelet's activation. What cleaved open space and summoned the God Hand to his castle was nothing more than an over-attachment to life and a deep fear of death. It wasn't any personal hatred towards Guts specifically. It was this desire to live that had summoned the God Hand, and no amount of begging was going to change their minds about this. Not even the fact that this man was an enemy of demon kind, which only drew laughter from the Count's guardian angels. Well, that and dismissal. Amongst all this trolling, Guts gets up and manages to advance towards Griffith without falling flat on his back, which uh, impresses Slam. She is, let's say, touched by his fighting spirit and willpower, and this becomes a recurring thing for pretty much the entire series. Slan is slightly disappointed when Guts finally passes out after coming close enough to Femto, but she is delighted by his recovery swing at him. Though it ultimately fails, it leaves a deep enough impression on her for her to want him to join their ranks. Conrad points out that Guts wasn't ordained by causality to ascend, so that wouldn't be possible, but that doesn't stop Slan from fawning over him. Yet it is at this very moment that Void calls for an end to the sideshow and begins proceedings for the main event. The Archangel of Demon Kind demands a sacrifice from the Count, and when he once again offers the Black Swordsman, Void tells him that it isn't good enough. Conrad reveals that since Guts was already marked, he couldn't be sacrificed twice, and Slan elaborates upon the nature of the reincarnation ceremony. The Invocation of Doom did not simply accept any lump of flesh and blood as its intended sacrifice. In order to ascend into a higher form of existence, a person's human heart must be frozen by the evil that permeates the God Hand's demonic existence. That means that they would have to sacrifice someone so close to them that they defined their humanity, and losing them would be akin to losing a part of one's own soul. Since Guts was just the Count's enemy, his life wasn't nearly as worthy for sacrifice as, say, his daughter's. When the Count asks if there wasn't any other way, Slan tells him that any other sacrifice would just be meaningless. Ubik just asks him to do what he did last time, and this is when we get the truth behind the death of Teresia's mother. As the child comes to terms with what her father did to just continue living, the God Hand presses the Count to go through with it. Slan reminds him that his life belonged to them anyway, so it wasn't as if by redeeming himself here he was going to rest in peace in heaven. Femto shows him where his soul was going to end up as he summons a portion of the abyss called Hell, and Slan informs all gathered that this is the fate of all those tangled with demon kind. They either resist and die, or die anyway, ending up as a part of the vortex of souls. She tells him that once his child belongs to demon kind, he would be delivered from his pain, but the Count chooses otherwise. As the thread of fate is severed, the Count's soul is dragged into the abyss. The spirits of the dead also try to take Guts with them, seeing as he was a demonic sacrifice and all, but the Black Swordsman defiantly fires off a parting cannon shot in Griffith's way, which makes them drop him. Slan glances back at the object of her fascination, anticipating another meeting with him real soon soon, and, sickly enough, her wish is granted. But this first appearance should give you an idea of what Slan's role was in the God Hand's entire routine. She would reveal the debauched inner desires of a person, and compel them to make the sacrifice she wanted them to make. If someone put up a display of defiance, their heroism would, uh, arouse her sense of justice, let's call it. But she would persist with her duty regardless. But it also explains to us how Slan's mind works in a given scenario, and that is crucial to understanding her past life as a human. This is also why her involvement in the Eclipse and the Incarnation Ceremony are both fundamental to discovering the reason behind her own ascension. So let's dive into that right away. She desires Guts and tries to push him into joining her side, Slan's involvement in the Eclipse, and Griffith's incarnation into the physical world. The next time we see the demonic dominatrix show up in the story is a brief vision that Griffith has in Chapter 49. Lying broken in both body and mind inside the Tower of Rebirth, the fallen Falcon thinks he's hallucinating when a brick falls loose from his cell's wall, but he soon realizes this is something more than reality, when dead spirits start gravitating towards him and four ethereal silhouettes take shape within the hole in the wall. These beings tell Griffith that they would wait for him at that time in that place, and inform him that he is their fifth kinsman, the Blessed King of Longing. Sure enough, their words ring truer than anything Guts had said to Griffith so far, because after escaping his own mercenary band, the fallen Falcon tries to give himself deliverance to no avail. This drives him into the depths of despair, and his blood enters the Behelet, activating the fetish and triggering the advent of the Eclipse. It's in this nightmarish interstice which is lorded over by 
a dead son and dotted with tormented faces all over that Slan makes her first canonical appearance. She rises from the ground like a giantess who towers above all with her harsh beauty before manifesting leather black wings that mark her as a member of the God Hand. Once the rest of her kinsmen manifest within the Eclipse's interstice, Void welcomes all present for the sacred nocturnal feast that happens once in 216 years. He personally welcomes his kinsman Griffith and addresses him as the Blessed King of Longing once again, which reminds the fallen falcon of the vision he once had. This ticks off Guts proper, who rebukes the God Hand for trying to turn his friend into one of their monsters, and this makes Slan cover his face as she laughs at his innocence. She admires his beautiful friendship with Griffith and lets him know that he will be an excellent sacrifice for his sake, as she reveals that the purpose of the Eclipse was to turn Griffith into a demon. After Ubeek gives the stunned Brand of the Falcon a lecture on what a behelet does to a person, Slan points out that Griffith's fetish was special even amongst them, as it was the only thing that could turn a human into a god hand, the Crimson Behelet, aka the Egg of the King. If you want to know more about these mysterious face stones, then we recommend you check out our Behelet Explained video. The only female god hand member relishes the idea that Guts and Co. were about to become theirs, but when the future Black Swordsman refuses to acknowledge the reality of the situation, she gives it to him in the simplest of terms. Guts was thinking that the God Hand would turn Griffith into a monster against his will. Slan explained that it was Griffith's will that would turn him into a sacrifice in the first place. Just as the Band of the Falcon starts denying the inevitable, Void declares that all lies within the current of causality, and it was now time to perform the Invocation of Doom. Conrad raises Griffith to the God Hand's altar, and Ubeek and Void show him his real self, one that has piled on and walked over the corpses of thousands of people just to attain his own selfish dream. Slan empathizes with him, acknowledging that his back alley path had been blocked by an unforeseen force, that being Griffith's obsession with guts. But even now, the White Falcon's feathers and wings gazed up at him with clear eyes that dazzled with hope. She thinks they should forgive him and welcome what is to come, and encourages Griffith to burn everything and bury it in the ruin of his dream. The Archangel of Demon Kind then seals the deal by making Griffith accept the fact that he wanted all of this all along, and that's enough to make the Falcon fall from grace and chant, I sacrifice, in his heart. As the Apostles begin their inhuman feast, Slan joins her kinsmen in chastising Guts for thinking he could save Griffith when he very clearly said he wanted to sacrifice all of them, but she is also the first to give him his flowers for doing his best to survive in such a maddening situation. Slan points out that the longer Guts struggles, the more his life energy becomes food for the new child of darkness and bids the dream known as Griffith farewell as she prepares to welcome her new kinsman, Femto. This is where she proves that she is the most perverted member of the God Hand. Slan doesn't do anything lewd, she just sheds a tear watching Femto violate Casca as his first act of existence because she finds it beautiful. Love, pain, pleasure, hate, every conflicting emotion was emanating from the scene that was being witnessed by dozens of apostles and Guts himself, and Slan proclaimed that this is what it means to be human and evil in this world. Her gaze was broken by the arrival of Skull Knight, who saved Guts and Casca from the interstice and whisked them away to Godot's mine, and she was just as surprised by this development as everyone else was. Ubik delights at the fact that such an unpredictable thing had happened at the Eclipse, and Slan admits that they themselves were not gods, merely their hand on Earth, so things like this could take place. But then she glances at Void and muses that either it was the leaping of a lone fish or this too was part of causality. Either way, the current of that sacred concept was too strong to be interrupted by Guts alone, and now that the fifth king had been born, it was time for the Age of Darkness to descend upon humanity, aka Welcome to Slan's Playground. As soon as the eclipse was over, Berserk went into the conviction arc with, well, full conviction, and it's not an exaggeration to say that Slan likely facilitated Griffith's incarnation in the physical world the most, because while Conrad brought the plague and Ubik most likely sent out the prophetic dream about the Falcon of Light, Slan was the one whose presence defiled the holy ground of Saint Albion the most. If you guys will recall from our Father Mozgus video, the reason why he was dispatched to that holy city was to root out a cult of heretics operating within its refugee colonies, and the evil goddess these people worshipped was Slan herself. Turns out, she had been influencing humanity as the goddess of flame, possibly for generations, and her teachings basically taught her disciples to be boundless. Now, you might think that this is a good thing, but you really aren't appreciating the true extent of the meaning of the word boundless. When nothing is off the table, even a place as cold as a cave can burn in a sea of flesh, drugs, and worse, and that's exactly what Slan's influence did near Saint Albion. Through her cult, she gathered all the evil energy that could be accumulated from human sin in one place, and when the incarnation ceremony began, her followers were the first to contribute to Femto's second ascension. Slan manifested momentarily after 
after the collapse of the Tower of Conviction in a blood blob avatar, but she herself wasn't there. Nope, instead she was somewhere near Enoch Village, because after Griffith came into the physical world, the boundaries between all three realms in existence began to blur, and Klipoff bled over into reality. And for those who are unaware of what that is, well it's the astral world's realm of darkness, over which Slan reigned supreme. The Black Swordsman and his allies were able to save Farnese and Casca from the trolls, and the Swordsman himself cut loose for the first time in a while, as he took his rage out on an endless sea of those nasty creatures. But just as he got done, his brand of sacrifice started gushing blood, and he realized that a God Hand member was arriving soon. That God Hand turned out to be Slan, who took an ethereal form for the first time in ages, though she did find it disgusting that it was troll guts that she was using as a vessel. She tells Guts she missed him, but then recants that statement by recounting all the times she felt his passions through his two-year journey in the darkness. She wants to feel his rage, his anguish, his fear, and to that effect, she strikes off his armor with a blow so deep that it wounds Guts's astral body. Slan wants him to defy her and run her through with Dragon Slayer, though she doesn't put this thought forward nearly as platonically as we have. But then, she muses whether he can even get the job done, because, after all, he was human. So she had an idea for Guts. Why didn't he use the behelet he was carrying, which was resonating with her presence, make a sacrifice, just like Griffith did? Before she can get her answer, a metal boomerang slams into her corporeal form, and Slan is interrupted by the Skull Knight, who wants her to let go of his fellow struggler. Slan, ever the provocateur, chastises the wandering wraith for interrupting a man and woman's personal time, but then wonders if his majesty was here to join them instead. If you want to know why she called him that, go check out our Skull Knight Origins video. The skeletal warrior refuses, of course, noting that she was the only one summoned, but Slan corrects him and tells him that she came here personally just to see her darling guts. She didn't know where the rest of her kinsmen were. Most likely, they had melted into their preferred Sephira, but this only made the Skull Knight want to take action, so he drew his sword and told Slan that the time for talk was over. The, uh, harlot princess of the Uterine Sea chastised him for being such a man about things, and used the domain of Klipoff, which might as well have been her womb, to manifest dozens of ogres and trolls with the intention of killing both strugglers. Skull Knight cuts a bloody path towards his target, but the waves of astral enemies just keep coming. Slan taunts him by reminding him that she could just spawn any number of these monsters whenever she wanted, but it was the wandering wraith's turn to tell her what time it was. Guts fires his arm cannon directly into Slan's abdomen, but she only seems to enjoy the feeling it induces within her. She asks him to give her more, and Skull Knight rallies the Black Swordsman by telling him his sword could give her what she wants. Tempered by the malice and blood of hundreds, nay thousands, of dead men and apostles, the Dragon Slayer could now affect beings on both a physical and astral level of existence, and was thus the perfect tool for the job. Guts did as he was told, and stabbed Slan right in the gut, apparently as she was in the process of giving birth to more astral monsters. She relished the commingling of life and death within her, and kissed Guts, telling him he's the best, and wishes she could meet him again, before allowing her forced advent to throw Klipoff into chaos. It took the Skull Knight busting out the Sword of Actuation for Guts to survive that Dominion collapse, and even then it was clear that things would never be the same again. The next, and final time we see Slan in the story is right after Femto triggers the great roar of the astral world and sends the globe back into a state of Fantasia. Slan manifests as a sea of flesh somewhere within the physical world, no longer needing forced advents to see her darling guts, and this is where her story stops for now. But taking into account everything we have learned about her personality through her many encounters with guts, we can make a few educated guesses about her life as a human, and that's exactly what we're going to do in this next section. She was a suppressed woman with dark desires whose life went downhill when she couldn't control it anymore. Slan's possible origins and reasons for becoming a god hand. Like most people who become thralls of demon kind, Slan too had a behelet at some point in her life and sacrificed someone close to her to gain the power she currently possesses. Moreover, the fact that she is a god hand is evidence that she was a possessor of the Crimson Behelet, which is quite possibly the only behelet that has been used by multiple people over multiple generations successfully. So at the very least, Slan's ascension took place 216 years before Griffith's eclipse, if not more. We know that the God Hand incarnations of a human being are just their evil parts condensed into a far more malevolent form. They are exaggerations of the evils that have come to personify humanity as a whole, and Slan in particular is the embodiment of lust. One look at her interactions with Guts will tell you this, if her character design doesn't already. But the purpose of this video is to deduce why she became what she is today, and to that end, we posit this 
theory. What if Slan is basically Farnese, but without the influence of the Black Swordsman? It is clear that desire was a definitive factor in Slan's life. After all, she has come to personify it for massive cannibalistic heretical cults, and God knows what else we haven't even heard of. But the way she treats causality and the kind of reverence that paradoxical events evoke within her suggests that her desires were suppressed in life, and so we give you two possible theories as to Slan's human origins. Number one, she was a nun, and number two, she was a princess. Both make sense because both would wield considerable influence in society and have close ties to many people as a result of it, which we know is necessary given the nature of a sacrifice that needs to be made to ascend to God Hand status. If Slan was a nun, then it kind of makes her similar to Ubeek and Void. If you want to know more about why we think that's the case, then check out their origins on our channel right now. But we basically think that the Holy See and the God Hand have a closer connection than one might think they do at first glance. So if we are to move forward with this assertion, then you can pretty much understand why we put this idea forth in the first place. A holy woman with unholy desires who found pleasure in heinous acts and indulged herself despite knowing the sinful nature of what she was doing. At some point, Slan acquired the Crimson Behelet, likely during an inquisition of some sort, and from that day onward she was destined to join the ranks of demon kind. Slan must have developed many close ties through her work as a nun and otherwise, but all that came crashing down one day when she was put in a near-death situation. Driven into the depths of despair, her deep desire to escape her paradoxical prison and her lifeblood flowing into the Crimson Behelet activated the fetish and summoned the God Hand. As always, Void performed the Invocation of Doom and Slan condemned those who had become synonymous with her story just to survive as a figurehead of demon kind. If she was a princess, then this remains pretty much the same except Farnese and Charlotte become more appropriate analogs. Any noblewoman is expected to behave a certain way, and being wanton and promiscuous is highly frowned upon in the case of women in Berserk's world. The Skull Knight does call her the Harlot Princess of the Uterine Sea, implying she used to be royalty, but it could also just have been a figure of speech. What wasn't a figure of speech was the fact that Slan knew the man Skull Knight used to be, and so another interesting possibility rises. What if she was alive in Geyseric's era? No one knows the Skull Knight's real identity save the great gurus and the God Hand, and Slan calls him Your Majesty when he arrives to aid Guts and clip -off. But that is a flimsy argument in our opinion. Sure, she could have been aware of Geyseric's empire and even been inspired by the final few debauched years of his reign, but she was not alive during his time. That's because we actually know that Void was the only human God Hand member to rise out of the abyss during Geyseric's branding, and the Eclipse's 216 year cycle meant that no one could have been alive during both that sacrificial ceremony and Slan's ascension, at least two full centuries later. Whatever the truth of Slan's origins might be, one thing is clear. Lust was a big part of her human life. It was her greatest source of pleasure and shame, and she did everything to deny that it was the former until one day she just couldn't. Marvelous Verdict. So that's how we imagine Slan's ascension went, kind of. Apart from Void, on whom information is scarce as it is, there isn't a lot to go on with the other God Hand members in terms of things that point towards their human identities, but that's the point of this exercise. Slan is a particularly interesting character to do such a deep dive into, not because of what you guys are thinking about, but because of the role Control plays in her portrayal. She celebrates and is moved to tears by complete chaos and anarchy, and yet she wields absolute control over what she wants and what she can do. She embodies lust and gives her followers freedom through desire. She is everything that a toxic person can be and then some. But then that's just it. Slan is supposed to be a representation of humanity's revolting perversion. And if we're right in saying that, then Miyora-san nailed it right on the head. We can't wait to watch her show up on the pages of a future chapter when Berserk returns. And once again, it isn't for the reason you guys think. That's all for now, but if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, be safe out there, and thanks for watching.